Hello, my name is Harrison Gable, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at Washington University in St. Louis. I'd like to thank the TBRS community for uh, the opportunity to, to tell you about the work we're doing to try to understand um, the genetic underpinnings of, of this disorder and how we're using mouse models uh, to do this work. And we're really uh, lucky at Washington University to have a number of re uh, research groups trying to understand the basic genetics of the disorder. You've heard from uh, Dr. Marwan Shnawi at this meeting um, about his work in diagnosis and, and in clinical understanding. We have my lab working on mechanisms in the brain um, of the disorder and of DNMT3A, as well as the, the research group of Tim Lay, understanding the disorder as a whole and also studying its, its impact in the blood. Um, so as a collaborative institution, we're, we're really uh, doing our best to make strides in understanding the disorder. Um, my lab itself uh, was established just a few years ago, um, and really we're trying to understand the basic mechanisms of how genes are turned on and off in the brain. And this has brought us to studying DNMT3A, the gene uh, mutated in TBRS. Um, we're building on background in understanding another neurodevelopmental disorder cause, uh, known as Rett syndrome, in which a reader of DNA methylation is affected. And this drew us into the field, and uh, we started studying how DNMT3A puts in uh, DNA methylation that you may have heard of, and I'll talk about more. Um, and we're trying to uh, apply uh, our, our expertise in this area to understanding TBRS caused by DNMT3A mutations and also autism um, that re results as well. And our approach is sort of twofold. We, we, um, we're really geneticists and biochemists uh, in the lab trying to understand the function of the DNMT3A gene. And specifically, we've had um, some work and I've spoken to, the, to this community in the past about our work to understand the individual mutations in the gene. You know, and every individual with TBRS has a mutation identified and, they, uh, and they're varied. And um, we've really tried to do the work to understand some of uh, what each of these mutations does to the gene, and can that tell us about the really the molecular basis of the disease? The other work we're doing is to try to um, sort of look at the um, overall impact on a sort of organismal level and really model the disorder. And this uh, involves using mice uh, uh, that I'll tell you about today uh, that carry mutations that are similar to the mutations that occur in individuals with TBRS. And the idea here is that if we can establish um, a vertebrate uh, model of the disorder in mice, we can better understand the, the sort of molecular and genetic underpinnings, and we can even use this mouse to start to brainstorm therapeutics that we might um, try to develop. Now, just a brief introduction, you will have heard about some of this over the course of the meeting, but um, it, TBRS is caused by mutation of the DNMT3A gene, um, which then results in disruption of the DNMT3A protein. So every individual uh, has two copies of the DNMT3A gene. And in an unaffected individual, these will, both of these copies will be working. And those copies of the gene really are read out to produce a protein that has a function inside your cells. And in DNMT3A's case, that protein has this function where it puts in a chemical modification on the DNA inside every cell that you have, this DNA methylation. And you need these two functional copies of the gene to produce the, the DNMT3A protein to then carry out this function. And this DNA methylation has a function of sort of turning on and off actually other genes inside the cell. Now, when you have TBRS, one of these uh, copies of DNMT3A is mutated. It can be deleted or have a, a single uh, letter changes in the gene. And as a result um, of that missing copy or that dysfunctional copy, less and, and uh, perhaps less functional DNMT3A is made. And the, the hypothesis is that that might lead to a change in the DNA methylation to less DNA methylation or different DNA methylation in various uh, tissues, including in the brain. So how can we better understand how this this genetic mutation uh, affects uh, the development and function of the nervous system as well as other aspects of, of human health. Uh, one, one approach that's been extremely fruitful for uh, researchers re um, in understanding developmental disorders as well as many other disorders is to study the same process in mice. 
And the idea is that mice have very similar genomes to our genomes, although they're you know, much smaller and, and much less complex. They tend to have all, all the same genes that we have, at least a copy of those genes. So if individuals in TBRS have a deletion, for example, of, of part of uh, one copy of their DNMT3A gene, we can make the same disruption in mice and we can study what's wrong with those mice at a, at a sort of a whole organism level at a cellular and a molecular level. And we call this knocking out the genes. We make a knockout mouse where we delete the gene. And then we can, uh, that, that mimics certain types of mutations that occur in TBRS. And then we can study exactly what's going on in the mice in a system where we can um, do experiments um, and really do a, you know, sort of an unlimited number of analyses to better understand what's going on in the brains of these mice as well as in other organ systems. So why is it useful to have a mouse model to study TBRS? Well, if we can establish that these mice have certain deficits, um, when you mutate the DNMT3A gene that, that mirror aspects of the disorder, we can then really uh, uh, do experiments on the mice and understand exactly how their organs are affected, how their growth is affected, how their, um, their, their brain function is affected. And it, because there's so much conservation in the way um, mouse cells work and human cells work, these uh, findings are often uh, sort of very predictive of what's going on in humans. And then we can make a lot of strides very quickly. And this allows us to dissect really at a cellular and a molecular level, the underpinnings of TBRS. We'll never fully understand how TBRS affects you know, human cognition um, and, and sort of the higher level functions of humans using these mice, but we can understand the most basic level. And that can help us start to think about uh, potential uh, treatments or, or therapies in the long run and really just get a better understanding of the disorder, which can, can help us moving forward. So that's the approach we've taken. We've made this uh, heterozygous, so this, this knockout of one copy of the gene. That's what this KO over plus means. And we started studying, do these mice have um, phenotypes? Do they have symptoms that in certain ways mirror the human disorder? suggesting that we can study them to better understand uh, TBRS in humans. So are the mice, do they have overgrowth? This, uh, this critical um, uh, commonality between individuals with TBRS, are they sort of the mouse version of tall? I'll get into that. Do they have changes in skull size since, you know, uh, in macrocephaly and enlarged head is part of TBRS? And then do they have, for example, changes in, in weight or feeding that have um, been starting to be observed in, in some individuals with TBRS? And then there's the behavioral um, side of things. Of course, um, mouse behaviors are not nearly as complex and varied as human behaviors, but we can observe them in very quantitative ways in a number of different assays, as we call them, to understand whether or not their sensory motor function is affected, whether or not learning and memory, sort of correlates of cognition are affected, um, and whether or not they have changes in the way they interact with other mice or look like they have anxiety-related behaviors. These are all simple versions that in some ways might mirror some of the challenges that individuals with TBRS have. And if we see these types of changes, we can then, as I mentioned, you know, really drill down and understand at a cellular and molecular level by, by doing biochemical, genomic, and other types of experiments, exactly how this DNA methylation that we think DNMT3A is so important for might be a change in, in the brains of these mice and in other tissues, how um, this altered DNA methylation might change cell function and we can even look for similarities with other disorders or places where we might target um, for therapeutics um, once we have the model going. So we've started looking in these mice and um, in a study that was just uh, recently published that I wanna summarize for you. Um, and in these heterozygous knockout mice, these, this model of TBRS, we see some changes in growth that we think do uh, mirror aspects of this disorder. We see subtle changes in, in the shape of the skull, including uh, at the back of the skull here, that suggest that, there, that this is sort of mirroring aspects of, of uh, macrocephaly that might be occurring in the disorder. We see changes in long bone length, the sort of mouse version of, a, of, a, of being tall is to have these you know, longer tibia and femur. And this occurs uh, in these, um, these TBRS uh, uh, model mice. And then we also see this later onset um, increase in weight, um, which, which may be uh, sort of uh, mirroring aspects of for some individuals in, um, in TBRS. 
So they seem to have some changes in growth um, that are similar to the disorder. Uh, we've done a number of assays looking at behavioral changes. I won't get into the details, details of these. It involves a lot of observation, um, certain uh, behavioral tasks that we put the animals through. But we see a number of changes in their behavior that suggest that their cognition is altered um, and that these changes might be relevant to the disorder. This includes changes in exploratory behavior, anxiety-related behaviors, um, some changes in repetitive behaviors, and some changes in learning and memory. So these mice do seem to have aspects that are mirroring um, TBRS at sort of the mouse level. And so we wanted to now use this model to really understand how um, at a molecular and cellular level, things might be changing. What we're really trying to do is sort of peer inside the cells and ask, how is the loss of DNMT3A affecting the cells? If we think about a, a brain, there are billions of brain cells, neurons, and in them, um, either when they're developing or uh, later, uh, sort of uh, when the brain is supposed to be working and carrying out cognition. Um, inside the nucleus, there's supposed to be the DNMT3A gene, having produced the DNMT3A protein, which puts in this DNA methylation. And that DNA methylation has uh, numerous functions that my lab studies. And we wanted to look and ask in our mouse, you know, is this methylation process affected and how? <coughs> Excuse me. So we can do that by uh, effectively doing um, uh, genomic assays and uh, assessing the activity of the DNMT3A gene and how losing this one copy, deleting one copy, might affect the DNA methylation. And in looking at this, we found that uh, this, this, uh, this knockout mouse model has pretty uh, substantial effects on DNA methylation in the brain. And in particular, there are actually pretty big effects on a special form of DNA methylation, which is called non-CPG methylation. The details of that aren't particularly important, but that's to, other than to say this is a, a type of DNA methylation that's really important for the function of neurons, we think. And it's more dramatically affected than some of the other uh, DNA methylation that occurs. That can be seen here in this data where we see a, a big reduction um, in, in these TBRS model mice. And that's particularly um, of note because it's actually this, this special DNA methylation is read out by this, this, uh, this protein that my lab studies, the MECP2 protein that's mutated in, in Rett syndrome. So we have a disorder TBRS where the writer, the, the enzyme, the, the protein that puts in the DNA methylation is mutated. And then we have another disorder, Rett syndrome, where the reader of that, of that DNA methylation that actually binds that methylation in the nucleus and, and helps it uh, carry out its function uh, is mutated. And these disorders are, are quite different from each other in terms of the way they present. However, we think there may be some molecular effects um, inside the cells of the brain that are shared between the disorders. And this is potentially relevant because we've been studying Rett syndrome for quite some time, and we have a lot of insight into how that disorder works. So there may be some insights into the pathology of TBRS um, that come from this finding. So um, from these initial studies, we've really, we think we've established a mouse model of TBRS that will be really useful going forward for understanding sort of um, the molecular and cellular underpinnings. Um, this is, uh, we think, uh, an important step and, and really a, a useful tool going forward. We found these molecular changes that overlap with this Rett syndrome gene, and our lab is actively studying that, those effects to see uh, how relevant they are to some of the um, impacts that occur in the mice, and potentially in individuals with the disorder. And then in future studies, we hope to use these mice to dissect what's going on um, in the TBRS brain. Now, um, since the, that first study of the deletion mouse, we've uh, moved on to establish additional mouse models of the disorder. And these can be useful for not just um, sort of basic studies, but also understanding how different mutations can have different effects. Excuse me. Um, so many people who have TBRS actually have mutations that are um, 
not deletions of the gene, but rather single sort of letter changes. So you'll often um, get a diagnosis of an R882H mutation or a P904L mutation. And these refer to changes really in, in the coding of the gene that affect the protein in a single place in the protein. And um, this is important because these different mutations can have different effects on the protein. They may all have a detrimental effect, but some can be not quite as bad as deleting the gene. We think that might be the case for this P904L. Some might actually sort of have rogue effects and, and be a little bit worse than deleting the gene, such as uh, we believe possible for R882H. So uh, every individual with the disorder will have these, uh, their mutation. And that could affect the varying um, phenotypes, the varying symptoms that they have compared to other individuals. And we wanted to start to look at that. So in collaboration with Tim Lay's lab, we've been looking at the R878H mouse. This is like the mouse version of this 882. We've also generated a new mouse that mirrors the P904L. And these are sort of two different severities of mutation potentially, and we want to study them directly. And we're carrying out very similar studies to what we did with the with the knockout mice, this deletion mouse, this first one I told you about. And um, these comparative studies have started to identify sort of core effects that we think are shared across the models and may represent the, the core effects in the disorder, but then differing severity and maybe some slightly differing um, sort of nature of some effects that could help to explain why individuals with different mutations might have different um, versions of TBRS. So what do we see? Well, we see uh, bone overgrowth and obesity in the two models where we've been able to look so far. So that seems relatively common. Um, in terms of behavioral deficits, um, the 882H, the, 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 the version of the mouse that has this potentially more severe mutation does seem to have more severe effects on their behavior, <laughs> suggesting that, that they, this mutation is a bit worse. And at the molecular level, we also see that it has stronger effects. In contrast, this, this uh, 904 variant that we're studying does seem to be a bit more mild at the behavioral level, although they all do have effects in this domain of this brain-specific DNA methylation that we've been studying. So we're finding common areas that are affected across these mice, but maybe some explanation for why some are more severe and some are mi more mild. So uh, those are the tools that we've developed in the ongoing studies. We're really trying to use these mice now to understand how this DNA methylation, this chemical mark put in by DNMT3A is changed um, and how that's going to change brain development and the function of cells in the brain and really give us at the level of sort of individual cells and circuits in the brain uh, what's wrong. Um, we're studying this brain specific DNA methylation uh, because we think it may uh, tell us uh, something about what's, what's going on in TBRS at the, at the molecular level. And we're studying how you know, differences in mutations might drive differences in symptoms. And then uh, we've also started some studies trying to look at uh, connections with other disorders, as I mentioned, Rett syndrome, as well as other overgrowth disorders, um, where we are looking to see if there may be commonalities uh, with Soto syndrome. And of course, our ultimate goal, um, where we're really putting the building blocks in place, is to try to understand you know, uh, where would be the opportunities to think about therapeutic strategies that for really a disease altering therapeutics. Um, and, and of course, this is uh, uh, a goal. And you know, we're really at the beginning of trying to, to, to work towards that, uh, that goal. So with that, I'll just uh, finish up by acknowledging uh, all the great people in my lab and our collaborators have worked on this. Um, really, this has been spearheaded by Diana Christian and Dennis Wu, two great students in the lab with help from uh, Russell Moore Sabin Nettles, Jenna Martin, and Yiren Liu, um, as well as many other members of the lab. And we've had great collaborators, uh, Joe Doherty, Susan Maloney, and Dave Wozniak, as well as Cheryl Hill at WashU and Mizzou. And as I mentioned, Tim Lay and Marwan Shinawi uh, have really created a great uh, collaborative environment where we think we can make uh, great strides working at Washington University. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And, and I guess we'll move on to uh, questions. Thanks.